Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. I'm Marin, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure that your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide a smooth webinar. Our upcoming webinars are on September the 12th. That'll be a Thursday at 3 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We'll be hearing from Catherine Grant. She'll be giving a presentation on double trouble, avoiding the same name trap. And then following that week on the 19th, we'll have a presentation from Brandon Plue. He'll be talking about uh, the Mormon Places website. And then um, following that week, we'll have uh, an updated look at myheritage.com with James Tanner. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website, or you can search in our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and our Twitter accounts. During the webinar, if you have any technical difficulties, you can use the chat box and I'll address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. For today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be giving a presentation on Family Search, uh, Family Search's Memories Gallery. Catherine Grant, um, after years on the sidelines, started doing family history and discovered that she loved it. Her specialty is helping new family historians find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library. She also presents at Riverton Saturday seminars and other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. Catherine works for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a technical writer and instructional designer focused on usability and process improvement. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and watching the sunrise. And if Catherine's ready, we'll turn the time over to her. Yep, I am ready. Marin, thank you so much. Let me just do the sharing here. And I believe we are ready to go. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope this webinar is exciting for you. It deals with a topic that really does touch hearts and help us be closer to our ancestors. And that is uh, memories that things that we can look at or listen to. And somehow that just really draws us closer to our ancestors. So we've got an exciting webinar ahead of us. I wanted at the beginning of the webinar to give a shout out to Bethann Wiseman, who is a QA engineer on the memories team at Family Search. She was kind of the technical advisor, if you will, for this webinar. She knows the memory system inside and out. And so she corrected mistakes and gave me additional information. Now, if there's any mistakes in the webinar still, they're, they're my fault, not Beth Ann's, but she was wonderful. And I just wanted to give credit to her for making this webinar a lot better than it would have been otherwise. So this webinar is about the Family Search Gallery, and in case you're wondering exactly what that is, it's a section of the FamilySearch.org website where you can add and manage all of your family history memories. Now, it's worth pointing out at this point that the Family Search Gallery was never intended to be a mass free photo storage service. I uh, have come across some people who had that impression, and that wasn't what Family Search intended. In other words, it's not supposed to take the place of Google Photos or something like that. The the memories that you upload here are particularly supposed to be related to family history. So I wanted to call that out at the beginning of the webinar. Also, this is one of three webinars that we'll be doing on memories. This started out as one webinar, but frankly, it got way too long. And so that all of you didn't have to sit through three hours here, we kind of broke it up. So today's is on the basics of the gallery. 
then we're also going to do one on power features of the gallery. And this may be especially helpful to you if you've got the basics down, but you'd really like to tap into some of those powerful features that give you extra capability in managing your memories. And then also we're going to do a webinar on the memories tab on the person page, because you can do some of the same things on the person page as you can do from the gallery. As far as audience for this webinar, this basics webinar is intended for users who have added or intend to add more than just a few memories. So if you only expect to add maybe three or four memories, maybe some photos of your grandparents or something, but you really aren't that interested in adding a lot more memories, you'll probably find the webinar on the memories tab of the person page to be what you're looking for. But if you plan to, to add, I would say more than maybe, oh, I don't know, 10 or 20 memories, then you will find the, the gallery very useful. And also, since this is more of an introductory or basic webinar, we're not going to get into power features. So this is a good webinar for you if you're fairly new to the gallery or haven't used it extensively and you want to get the basics down before you move on to the power features. So here are the five things that we're going to be covering in our webinar today. First of all, what are memories on FamilySearch? The reason it's going to be helpful to talk about that is that FamilySearch uses the term memories in a little bit, little bit different way than we might use it in ordinary conversation. Then we're going to just do a brief intro to the gallery. Then we'll talk about adding memory to the gallery so that you have something to manage on your gallery. We'll talk about how you can add details that enrich those memories on the gallery. And then finally, we'll go over the basics of viewing and organizing those memories. Okay, so about memories on Family Search. When we talk about a memory on Family Search, we're actually talking about four different types of artifacts. Number one is photos, number two is stories, number three is documents. And number four is audio recordings. Now, photos and stories are probably pretty obvious, right? Photo is something visual that you look at. An audio recording is something you can listen to. But I find when I'm working with people that they get a little bit confused about stories and documents. I did myself before I asked some questions to figure out what the difference was. And this is what I discovered you would kind of tend to think that the difference would be based on content, but that's actually not the case. As they're classified on family search in the gallery, stories are items that are types of memories that are typed directly into an online form. So you can type text in, or actually you can copy it from like a Google doc or something, but it's a text so something that you enter online and you can attach photos to it. Whereas a document, again, as categorized in the gallery, is a file that's created elsewhere, for instance, in a word processing program, and then it's uploaded to the gallery. So that's the difference, really. It's not the content of the thing, it's how it was created. And we'll see examples later on of the differences between those two types of them. It's important to remember that family search is family friendly. So anything, any memory that you add needs to abide by the guidelines. So all photos are screened for appropriateness. So really, it's not anything that you wouldn't expect. So it, it just picture in your mind that you want anything that you add as a memory, you want this to be appropriate for a child. So whether, you know, it's your own children or a primary class or something, but you want anything that you add to not be to not jeopardize the safety of our family search community in any way or not provide offense in a way by promoting violence or um, inappropriate dress or action or anything like that. I only touched on two of the most obvious things here. Of course, we want to avoid violence, nudity, and so forth. But the full guidelines are available on the same page where you upload memories. And we'll see later on where that is. But you can just click the link and you can read over the short guidelines. And then you can be aware of what is appropriate and what is not in the gallery. 
If a photo violates policy, you'll get an email notification. I have to laugh because I actually, when I was testing stuff, just random things to get ready for this webinar, I did upload something that was not appropriate. It was not within guidelines. Now, it wasn't anything wicked or evil or anything. It was just, it violated one of the policies. So I got the nicest email from FamilySearch. I hadn't even been paying attention, so I didn't realize that I'd done it. And I got this very nice email saying, you know, we're so sorry, but you uploaded something that goes against our policy guidelines. If you feel that you've received this email erroneously and the, it really doesn't violate guidelines, please email us back and we'll work with you. And it was just a very tactful and nice email. So I went in actually and deleted the thing that wasn't appropriate. But say that you uploaded something and it was, uh, you got this email and you really felt that it was appropriate. Well, the sense I got from the email is that they're very willing to work with you and to hear your explanation as to why you feel it would be appropriate. So that's just something to be aware of when you're uploading photos. Now, this all does just the screening and such only apply to photos because text is no longer screened. There was a time when it was, and if it you had some you know swear words or questionable words, you'd get notified. But I understand now from Beth Ann that text is not screened any longer, and I'm not sure if audio ever was actually, but I know at least now audio is also not screened. Family search is depending on us as members of the community to kind of keep an eye out for each other. And if we do see a photo that's violent that somehow got past screening or we hear an audio, audio recording that's not appropriate, then we are supposed, or excuse me, not the photos. Those are all screened. I very much doubt that would happen. But if you read a story maybe that depicts violence or that um, another obvious example is someone has uploaded maybe something about their business or something that violates copyright. And so those types of things, it would be appropriate to report those. And you do that by clicking the report review, excuse me, the report abuse button. And abuse might sound like a strong term, but all they mean is that it goes against the guidelines that Family Search has established. So if you see something like that or hear something like that, and you feel good about it, go ahead and, you know, good about reporting it, go ahead and report it. And I can say, based on the email that I got that was so tactful and so nice, that we can trust Family Search to handle that in a very tactful and sensitive way if you do need to report something that's not appropriate. What about videos? This is a question that gets, gets asked a lot. Let's say you have this wonderful video of your family vacation, you know, a, a beautiful lakeside scenery or something like that. Your family's just having a great time. The kids are having fun. Can you upload that as a memory? Well, right now, the answer is no. And I've been told that the reason for that is that all visual media are screened, as we just talked about. Family Search does have the resources to screen the vast number of photos that are added. But imagine if you had to screen all these videos, too. And videos could be you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. So you can imagine what a drain that would be on family search resources to have to verify that all videos were appropriate. So for the time being, family search has not, they're not allowing us to upload videos. Now, who knows what the future holds? And I'm not saying that because anybody said anything to me. It's just that technology changes and so forth. So in the future, Maybe it'll be possible, but at this time, we are not. Um, it, there's no ability to add videos as memory items in the gallery. Hey, Catherine. Yes. Um, could you move your mic just a little bit closer? A couple of the viewers are having a hard time hearing you. Oh yes, I'd be glad to. I just did. Is that better? Um, or, is it better for you, Marin? Or yes, it sounds better for me. Okay. And those of you who are having difficulty hearing, please message Marin if this still isn't good, because I can probably uh, um, adjust the volume on my microphone as well. So thank you very much for for bringing that up. So let's look now at an intro to the gallery and just kind of get a basic sense of the the functions and features that are available. So the gallery is accessed by hovering over the memories 
uh, menu item here at the top of pretty much any family search page, and then just choosing gallery. And when you do, you will see a screen that will look somewhat similar to this. The, the difference will be that you uh, obviously we'll have different memories, but the rest of the items, the menu and panels and so forth should look pretty much the same. So for purposes of our webinar and explanation today, we can divide this, this layout, the gallery layout into three different sections to make it easier for us to talk about. The first section I'm going to call the view menu. Now these aren't official titles. I guess it's maybe the technical writer in me that's that's coming out. I found it it helps to give things names. And so I'm going to call this the view menu because it allows you to view your memories in different ways. And then we've got what we'll call the organization panel, which allows you to organize your memories, to categorize them, if you will, into ways that are useful for you. And then finally, we've got a content area, and this just includes all the memories that you have either added directly into the gallery or, interestingly enough, that you have added on a person page and tagged to somebody in the tree. So that's I was surprised when I first signed on to the gallery to see memories there that I had not added in the gallery, but I had actually added them on a person page and I had indicated who they were for, and so they showed up here in my gallery. One thing to be aware of is that the memories page, the, the content area was built for about, to support about 6,000 memories. There's not a hard and fast uh, cutoff. In other words, if you try and upload the 6,000 and first memory, it's not gonna say, oh, sorry, you've hit your limit. But instead, you'll probably notice that performance will degrade. So it'll, it'll take longer for the page to load and longer for, you know, sorting and moving into albums and so forth. And again, it's like we said earlier, this was never, the gallery was never meant to be a free photo storage system for every single photo that you've ever taken. It really is meant to be for family history photos. So 6,000 seems like a, a pretty generous upper limit for um, getting good performance out of the gallery. So if you don't have anything in your gallery, let's talk about how you can add things so that you've got something to manage. Family Search has made this incredibly easy. You don't have to worry about what type of memory you're uploading. You don't have to navigate through menus or anything. There's a one fits all button right here that's always at the top of the gallery. And when you click that, you go to the page that allows you to add memories of whatever type they may be. This blue box here shows you the upload guidelines and policies. So if you want to read the whole policies, and, and, and I would recommend that, it's not long, and it just gives you a good idea of what's appropriate in this community and what they've asked us not to include. So that's where that link is. And then there are three ways, that are three choices actually for adding memories to the gallery. The first one is that you can upload photos, documents, or audio files simply by dragging them to this area or by clicking choose files and then navigating to the place where those are on your hard drive or your device. The second option is that you can actually type in a story. We talked about the online story form. So when you click this button, you'll get that online form. You'll be able to type right into it or copy from a Google Doc and you'll be able to attach up to 10 photos there. And then finally, you've got the option to import photos from other services, such as Instagram or Facebook or Google Photos. Now, here's a, a great feature, I think, that FamilySearch makes it really easy when you upload memories to the gallery they can pretty much tell what type it was supposed to be based on the file type, you know, whether it's a photo or whether it's a document. So this is basically, these are the rules that they use to determine what the type, and we'll see why that becomes important later on. But just know that if you upload a file that has a JPEG, TIFF, or BMP bitmap, or PNG extension, then those are going to be categorized as photos. If you upload anything that's got a PDF extension, it's going to, and that's the three characters at the end of a file name, 
or you can tell also by looking at the icons if you don't choose to display extensions on your operating system. But you can tell because the PDF icon, right? If you've uploaded a PDF file, then that's going to be classified as a document. And if you upload an audio file, like an MP3, M4A, or a WAV file, they'll all be classified as audio. So the photos and audio are pretty straightforward. Um, or excuse me, actually I should say the audio is pretty straightforward, but the photos and documents, there can be some overlap there. For instance, I had a an image of a birth certificate that was a PNG file. So when I uploaded it, the gallery automatically classified it as a photo, but I didn't really want it classified as a photo because I considered it a document. It was a birth certificate. Well, again, gallery to the rescue. If you feel that they have misclassified an item, then you can classify it to the way you want it to be. And we'll see later on how you do that. Once the memory is added, if it was a photo and has to be screened, then you'll get a little message on it saying that it's undergoing screening. In my experience, the screening goes very, very rapidly. I don't think it's ever taken me longer than, oh my goodness, I want to say maybe half an hour or an hour, and most of the time it's within minutes. So I say that just so that if you've never had the screening, you know, you may have been thinking, oh my goodness, is it going to take days for the memory to show up? In my experience, no, it's always been pretty rapid. And the screening is complete and the screening message disappears. So now let's talk about one of the most wonderful features of the gallery, and that is the ability to add details about a memory. Have any of you had the experience of going through maybe a scrapbook or a box of old photos and you look at the back of the photo or you see if there's any information about the person and there is nothing whatsoever and you just want to cry or pull your hair out or something going, oh my goodness, I have all these amazing photos and I have no clue who they're about. Obviously they're important because somebody saved them and they got passed down maybe from grandmother to daughter to whoever and I ended up with them and I have no idea who these photos are about. And that to me is one of the saddest things, because if you don't know who those photos are about, you can't feel the same type of connection as you can if you know who they are and how you're related to them. So Family Search has made it possible for you to add rich details about any memory that you upload. Again, they've made it super simple to add details about any memory. You just click the memory. You'll also notice here that there is a little add tag button, and that's referring to tagging it to a person in the tree, like who is this memory about? That shows up before you've added at least one tag. But the interesting thing is if you click add tag or if you just click the memory, you get taken to the exact same screen. And that screen looks like this. So here I see the memory and the, the screen for uh, documents and such, they're slightly different, but they're so similar that we'll just, we'll go ahead and use the photo as an example. And the other little differences will be self-evident to you, I think, as you, as you play around with this. The first thing that we want to do for this photo is add a title. Again, super simple. You just click add title and this little form opens up and you can just click a brief title and then you click save and the title appears in a large green text above the image. You, if suppose you made a typo as I do from time to time, you just click edit title up here and you get that form back and you can make any correction that you want to make. What's cool about this is that the title shows up on the main gallery page under the photo and it also shows up on the memories tab of the person page. So you can see how adding that title could be very valuable, not only to you in the gallery, but to anybody who happens to go to somebody's person page and look at that memory.
The next thing you can do, and I, I'm sorry I keep saying this, but I really do love all these features. These are so awesome because they connect us to these people. This is a relatively new feature where you can add a recorded memory about this photo. How cool is that? You just click the record button and right on your device, you can record something like, I remember the time when we visited Stonehenge and it, they didn't have the fence around it at that time and et cetera, et cetera. And just imagine if you were maybe the granddaughter or great granddaughter of the people in this photo, let's say it's 100 years or 200 years later, and you've gotten onto family search or whatever the system's called 200 years later, but you are actually able to hear the voice of your great great grandmother or somebody recording their thoughts and observations about this memory. I can't even imagine how meaningful that would be to somebody. So take a minute if you're so inclined to record something, just your, your feelings and observations about these memories that you're adding. Right below that, you can uh, keep track of the number of people who have viewed this memory and the number of people who have made comments on it. Since I just barely added this one, these are both at zero, but over time, I would expect that those numbers would probably um, increase. And then if you're not the type of person who's really comfortable recording a memory, you've got another option down here that you can just type in some comments or observations about this photo. Okay, and here is one of the most powerful features of working on this detail screen, and that is being able to tag people in the image. They're using tag in the exact same way that you do on Facebook. So you can click on the photo and, and indicate you know, in Facebook, you click on the photo and you indicate what user that is in that photo. Same thing in Family Search. So you click on the photo and it just pops up this frame and it's not probably going to be over the top of the person that you wanted on because it's just popped up randomly. So you can drag it to wherever you want it to be. And if it's not the size you want, then just click and drag this green button, either make it smaller or make it larger. And then it will be the, you know, the, just exactly the way you want it. Once you've done that, once you've dragged it to the place where it should be and you've sized it properly, then you want to indicate who it's about. So this is my grandmother and I started typing my grandmother's name in here and it popped up a list of possible matches here, all of whom have the name Minnie as part of their full name. So you may be asking, how does the system determine what shows up in this possible tag list? Obviously, it didn't search every single mini in the 1.2 billion people in Family Tree because that would have been an, a completely unwieldy list. Instead, it narrows that list to three categories. It will go five generations back on your ancestors, it will go one generation down from you, and it will show people in your recents list. Well, you may run into a situation which happened to my sister the other day, where she wanted to tag some siblings on a photo, which were not included in one of these three categories. And so she said, how am I going to get them to show up so I can tag them. Well, there are some advanced ways to do that, and we will be talking about that in the Power Users webinar. But for now, the easiest way to do that, honestly, is just to go visit the person page so that that person you want to tag shows up on your recents list. That's a quick and simple way to get them in this drop down, and then you can choose them. There are some other options over here. You can add the date of the photo and you could add the place of the photo and you can also add a description. Now you might be asking what's the difference between the description and recording a memory or adding comments about a photo. Family Search has not established hard and fast rules about that. In fact, to my knowledge, they haven't established any rules about it. But when I look at the context of this, it seems to me that the description would just be a general description, whereas the recording 
or the comments here would probably be more personal, things that you remember about this particular memory. So again, that's not any kind of a hard and fast rule at all. But if you're wondering, gosh, what's the difference? That's a, that's a possible way that you could distinguish what you want to put in which section. Underneath that, you've just got some um, helpful information who contributed this memory. If you click on the person's name, you will be able to contact that person, send them a message. You've also got the file name here in case that's helpful. And then here's kind of a cool option. It's a little bit the reverse of uh, the story function that we looked at earlier, where we saw that if you click that button to add a story, you can add a story and attach photos. Well, in this case, you've already got the photo, but you can click the that add button under stories, and then it brings up the stories form with this photo attached to it. So really what it's doing is creating a new story memory. It's just a, a very convenient way of creating that, because you might be in here on the photo and just think, oh, my goodness, I, I totally remember something that we did when we visited Stonehenge that day, and I really want to write it as a story. It's too long for a comment. It's not really a description. I want to make it into a story. Well, here they've made it super easy for you to do that. And then the last thing that you can do here on this page is add um, this photo to an album. We haven't yet talked about albums. We will in a few minutes. But basically, they're just kind of the electronic equivalent of an old-fashioned photo album. It's a way of categorizing photos into different buckets, if you will. For instance, on this one, let's say that I wanted an album for memories of England. And then I wanted an album for memories of my grandmother. So I established all these, set up all these albums. And the cool thing is you can actually put photos in more than one album. So in this example, I haven't put the photo in any album yet, but I could click add to album and then I could click memories of England. Then I could click add to album again here on the same photo and uh, make it be memories of my grandmother. So this is just a really great way to organize your memories. And you don't have to worry about hard and fast categories. You can put the, the photo in multiple categories, whatever makes sense for the way that you want to organize your memories. Just a few more menu options on this page. You can easily navigate through the, the photos in your gallery without leaving this detail page by clicking the previous and the next button buttons. And then you've also got this little menu underneath the title. I took a, a screenshot here of the different options available on the actions dropdown. We're not going to take time to go through every one of them because most of them are probably pretty pretty clear, like rotate left or download, add to album. But this is the place where you can reclassify the document if it's been classified incorrectly. So if it's they've classified it as a photo, but you really want it to be a document, as in the example where I had a PNG file of a birth certificate, then I would click on actions and I would say change to document. It's as simple as that. If you've got a document that maybe contains photos it, and it had been classified as a document, but you wanted it to be photos, if you clicked on actions on that file, you'd see a thing here that said change to photos and you would be able to change it to photos or photo probably singular, I'm guessing. The next one is liking, and that functions may be a little bit different than liking on social media. Well, there's a little bit of overlap, but let's let's look at how it works in the gallery. In a way, it's actually similar to making a favorite. So you can like your own memory and you can like other users' memories, and everything that you've liked is categorized under my likes in the gallery, and we'll see where that is in just a second. But see how that can kind of, it's, it's like making it a favorite because you can have all your quote liked memories in one place in your gallery. 
And the last one is the share button. And you can see here from the drop down, you've got the ability to share on social media, to share via email, or to just share by a link. But there's one thing to be really cautious of there is that if you share this link, it will be available to everybody. They don't have to have a family search account. If they have one, they don't even have to log in. So basically, wherever you share this, anybody who has access to shared it will be able to see the memory, regardless of whether, or the item, I should say. They don't actually have to sign on to family search, but they'll see the photo or see the document, regardless of whether they have a family search account or not. And okay, here I'll have to admit, this is one thing that puzzled me when I was first playing around on the gallery. I got in here and I was having so much fun with the, the details page. And then I was like, how do I get back to the main gallery page? And I thought, well, I can hit my browser's back button, but that doesn't necessarily always work depending on what you've done since you navigated to this page or whatever. Well, the very simple way is, you know, try the back, the back button, it could well work. But this gallery option right here will always get you back to the gallery too. So that's an easy way to return back. Okay, so now that we've talked about adding that rich detail to memories, let's talk about the different ways in which you can view them in the gallery. So that takes us back to the view menu and let's look at the different options that are available. The first set of options are what we could call filters. You can see that there's five different options here. We've got all, and that's the default. And you can tell what option you're on because there's an underline on it. But then you've got kind of some, some pretty clear icons here. You've got photos. This one is stories. Again, stories and documents, sometimes there's some confusion. But the thing is, if you hover over this in the real system, you'll see a little tooltip that will tell you what the, what the icon is for. So we've got photos, stories, documents, and audio. And when you click any of those, the main content area is filtered to only show those items. So if I click document, or excuse me, click photo, it's only going to show photos. Click stories, it's only going to show stories. This is the area where the categorization becomes important. So if I had something that was a document to me, but was categorized as a photo, that's why I would want to change it on that menu that we just looked at so that when I click one of these filters, it shows up in the correct place. Next, we've got the filter and sort dropdown, or well, sorry that it's actually called the arrange dropdown, but what it does is allow you to filter and sort. And currently, it's got five different options. You can sort your memories from newest to oldest. You can sort them alphabetically. You can sort those with no top, actually you can filter, I apologize, it's not a true sort, I don't believe, but instead it filters to just show you memories with no titles, which makes it very easy for you to just go in and add all the titles. You can also filter to untagged memories, in other words, those that do not point to any person in Family Tree, and you can also filter to those who are not in any album. Next, you've got some layout options. You may be familiar with these if you use Google Drive. You've got two different options. The first one is a grid view, and that's what we're looking at down here. So we just see the memories displayed in a grid with tiles. The other view is a list view, and that can be really useful if you want to do a lot of things at the same time. For instance, suppose that I had added a bunch of memories, but I had never really bothered with the date, and now I want to go through and do all the dates at once. Well, I can change to list view, and I can very easily see all my memories that don't have dates so that I can just click add a date, click add a date, click add a date, and just very quickly and easily get all those dates added. The last item up here in the view menu is the search. And when you click that, you get this, this search field. And it's important to understand what it does search and what it doesn't search. It searches titles, descriptions and file names only. So I tried searching by a PID or an ID number like, you know, KWXQ123 of a person and it does not search PIDs. 
The other thing it doesn't search is anything that is not showing in the content area at the present time. So over here, you can see that I'm looking at my memories, that particular bucket, if you will. So if I run a search right now, it's going to search anything in my memories, but it's not going to search items in the archive or the likes or recently deleted. It's only going to search what you can see right here on the screen. Okay, let's talk finally about organizing memories. And the way you can do that is with the organization panel. Let's talk about each one of the options here. So the first one is my memories, and that is all memories except archived and deleted. The next one is archive, which is kind of a holding area, if you will, for memories that you're not currently working on. So suppose that you had uploaded, say, 100 memories, and you had put details, complete details on 50 of them. And your, your content area was, was kind of crowded with those 100 memories. And so you decided, you know, I want to move out all the ones that I've already put full details on. I want to get them out of the main content area and put them over in the archive so that I can kind of focus on what still needs to be done. Well, that's an example of a good use for the archive. The next thing you can look at is any memory that you have liked, whether it was added by you or added by someone else. So here's an example. I went to my, uh, let's see, my uncle's page. And my uncle had passed away when I was a child. And his wife, who is still a living, has, had written a, just a cute little story about when they were first married and she'd burned some bread and he was just so sweet about it. And I read that story and I could remember my Uncle Kenneth and I thought that was just so delightful. And so I liked the story. And when I got back to the gallery, that story was then showing up under my likes. So even though I didn't add that story, by virtue of my liking it, it's going to show up in my gallery under likes. The next thing is deleted memories. So an example of this is when I uploaded the memory that was against policy with total accident, didn't mean to do it, but then I went ahead and deleted it. And once you delete it, it, sometimes you know you want to delete it immediately and you can do that when by going into recently deleted, but otherwise uh, the gallery gives you a safety net. So suppose that you deleted something and then five days later you realize, oh my goodness, I don't have a duplicate of that any place or my hard drive crashed and I need to get it out or something. Well, up to 120 days, you can go back in to recently deleted and you can restore those memories that are in that bucket. Albums are another great feature that allow you to organize memories in ways that make sense to you. So you can create a new album by, guess what, clicking new album. And when you do that, it shows up as a name down here and you can create just albums in any any type of album that makes sense to you. We gave some examples earlier of maybe memories of my grandmother or memories of England. Then you can easily get your memories into an album by just dragging and dropping them. Notice that on this one, I clicked this memory and I got a, a blue check mark here. But at the time that I did that, all the other memories got a check mark too, but they're not selected. But if I wanted to select more than one memory to drag to that album, I would just click as many of those memories as I wanted, memory, as many of those check boxes, and then I would drag the whole batch over here to the album, and then they would all be categorized in that album. So that brings us to the end of our webinar today on the basics of the gallery. We talked about what memories are in Family Search. We uh, did a brief overview or intro to the gallery. We talked about adding memories, adding details about memories, and how to view and organize memories. And just to give you a teaser of the next 
webinar, or actually I should say the power user webinar, because I think actually the memories tab one is the next one. But for those of you who are particularly interested in the power features of the gallery, we're going to be covering features like uploading directly to albums, importing from social media accounts, adding memories submitted by others to your albums, and more. So watch for that webinar, I would say probably coming within the next, uh, probably no more than six to eight weeks. So we hope that you will join us for that memory when it is given. And that brings us to the end of this webinar for today. Thank you so much for joining us. And Marin, do we have any questions? I don't see any right now, but the chat box is open. You're welcome to type your questions in. Thank you very much. All right, I think that's um, all the time that we have for today. If you have any questions, you're welcome to email at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. And I can pass those questions on to Catherine. Um, and I will, um, Oh, there, uh, Catherine answered that question. Uh, so this recording of this webinar will be posted on our YouTube page and on our website. That'll be up on Monday morning. And our next webinar will be with Catherine as well on the 12th. So we hope that you can join us for that. Um, if you'd like to access another recording, um, all of our previous webinars are on our website or on our Facebook, uh, our Facebook and our YouTube channels. Um, our website is fh.lib.boau.edu. Thank you so much, and we hope that you can join us next time.